Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Matt Horn is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Syndicate has to answer for what they did. And this time, we're taking the fight to them. You ready for this? Time to get to work. Ugh, fuck my life. Rob Van Dam, talk to us from where are you talk to us from, Rob. I am at home, which is currently Las Vegas, Nevada, for the foreseeable future. Oh, okay, that's good. I've got to sort of be nice here and say that I am aware that you're a wrestler or a retired wrestler. I don't know which which one would you choose. Oh, hmm. well, you know, it's easy to say because I am in control of that decision. I'm still wrestling. I am a wrestler. I will one day be a retired wrestler, but then once I'm a retired wrestler, I hope that I hope that I don't also become a wrestler because a lot of wrestlers don't put much credit into the whole retirement thing. I don't know. I don't think that's going to be me. I think that would uh, dissipate my credibility. Mm, mm. So one of the questions I've always wanted to ask, <laughs> how does a wrestler cope with... A COVID-19 lockdown. The lockdown has been so awesome. Here's how this wrestler deals with COVID-19. Uh, awesome home that has everything you need at it. My gym, my pool, my girls. Got Katie Forbes. I mean, that's all anybody needs. But as a bonus, you know, maybe, uh, maybe Jennifer too. It really didn't change a lot about my lifestyle. This is sort of conjured up uh, the terms self-isolation and social distancing. I imagine for a wrestler that's pretty hard to do. Well, um, we took time off work. I myself had my last match February 21st in Qatar. And then I was off and did social distancing, uh, stayed away from everybody except for uh, my family. And then... Just last week, went back to work for the first time, and we flew to Nashville. Yeah, while you're wrestling, it's pretty hard to social distance, but then there still, there still were a lot of measures taken to try to be as safe as we could. There's only so many wrestlers in the building at the same time. We filmed in the daytime in front of uh, no crowds. A lot of guys had masks, stuff like that. Well, the reason why we've got you here is obviously for the wrestling, but it's also because... They have remastered Saints Row the Third, which has just been released. Obviously, you were in Saints Row the Third and the Fourth. What do you remember about the production of, of both games? It was so much fun commentating with my uh, partner. Please insert name here. We had a lot of fun and a loose script, uh, so... We kind of went all over the place with it and threw in a lot of uh, swear words that, that weren't there just because it seemed right. Oh, my God. Did you see that? It's raining. No, wait. It was a deeper voice. Oh, my God. It's raining blood. Something like that. I mean, the chap that you're referring to, I think, I'm hoping it is, it's, it's Mike Colucci. That sounds right. Because he mentioned about you the other day. Yeah, and it was just us two in a room, you know, so we didn't have any interaction with... The action that we're calling, <laughs> we had a script that, and some of it, you know, we went pretty far off of too, but it was all under uh, Keith Aram's uh, watchful eye. He was there to, to approve everything, and there was a lot of laughing going on. Probably you, you won't know about this, but there's, there's talk of a film adaptation. Wow, that's awesome. It's very, it's very popular, Rob. Surprisingly popular. I mean, they're doing a fifth one. They're doing a fifth Saints Row, so presumably you'll be asked back. I sure hope so. I lived a lot closer to the studios than I do now, but, you know, 
Las Vegas is kind of like the backyard of L.A. I was there from 98 until, uh, I guess, just the very end of 2018, and then I moved to uh, Las Vegas. So, whole different life now. But, you know, I'm not too far to do that. I would definitely be inspired to to work again on this on the next one, absolutely. Mm. I mean, one of the things that makes it so popular is, is kind of the satire the controversial nature and the satire of the of the game. I think that's why the fans have probably taken to it. I mean, I do have to ask the question, where do you think Bobby, which is the character that you did, where do you think Bobby could sort of go now? I mean, obviously you say he was commentator. Could he commentate something bigger, do you think? There was a lot of action that we were that we were calling, you know. It wasn't like just a wrestling match, if I remember right. It's like uh, mass murders and <laughs> it's murder ball now when you say something bigger you don't mean bigger than a video game right you mean within the confines of just of calling some action i mean if they, they if they did the fifth one you presume that they might try and do a satire on the presidential elections maybe possibly yeah absolutely i don't see mm. any boundaries that uh that the, the duo can't handle it was one of sort of the first character roles that you've had. I mean, obviously you've you've done games as as obviously as your wrestling name. Has it encouraged you to go more into into gaming? Is that some kind of avenue that you would follow, like mocap? I would love to. I had a lot of fun with it, and you're right. You know, a lot of times I am portraying RVD, so it is fun to get outside of of that box and um i had a blast and i would love to uh to do stuff like that in the future i think after the first game i might have told my my agent that represents me in hollywood that i would totally be opening to doing voiceover work where you know wherever it's needed but that was so long ago i don't think anything ever came of it except for a conversation maybe when i hear my own voice I think there's something wrong with the audio. I can't believe it's that um, hoarse or scratchy. and uh, So, you know, I, I don't know if I would hire me, but it would be fun. So, obviously, we need to talk a bit about you, Rob, you yourself. Obviously, I've mentioned the fact that you are a wrestler. What made you want to get into wrestling in the first place? Well, I was a fan, so I was super excited about the whole industry, about being around the live shows, you know, meeting the wrestlers. I thought the whole thing was just larger than life until somebody told me that I should start lifting weights. And when I turned 18, they would help me get into the business and I could be a wrestler. Um, after that seed was planted, I was pretty much one track minded and uh, knew that even if I didn't succeed, I was going to put in a couple of years trying my best. You know, I didn't have size or you know, really like, you know, uh, connections. I mean, I grew up in Battle Creek, Michigan, and nobody knew anybody famous. But I did have somebody that traveled with WWE that told me they could get me in. And although I lost contact with that person way before I ever got into the profession, uh, they planted the seed. And after that, boom, I was going to make it happen. What advice would you give to anyone wanting to pursue a career in wrestling? Well, it's changed so much. You know, it used to be about size. Now it's about athleticism. Thank you very much. Uh, I will take credit for bridging that gap. Everyone wants to be like RVD now. I used to be the only guy doing flips and splits, and, and it's because the other guys were 275 pounds. But because the style was such... They could party every night, drink themselves, you know, to a coma, take pills. Now the guys don't party that much because they're legitimate athletes. They're into cannabis more. They don't have to take uh, steroids and be all jacked because the average wrestler is probably like 180 pounds. You know, it's different advice totally than, than would have been relevant 30 years ago when I started. But just, you know, be aware of that trend and where it's going. And, you know, I would say... You know, I would, I would just say do it for the right reasons, you know. You, you got to love it enough to make up sometimes for a big enough paycheck. You got to pay a lot of dues, just like with anywhere else. And you got to know, just like in any field, if you want to be a superstar, chances are against you, 
that doesn't mean you can't do it. If you believe you can do it, then I believe you can do it. I've had a number of different wrestlers on in the past 10 years. I mean, this is how long it's been going on for. And obviously a lot of them have pursued acting careers or some kind of career that isn't obviously predominantly wrestling. One of the things I always get sort of confused about is it is a sport. We can say that it is a sport, but there's a lot of a lot of theatre almost, isn't there, to it? Yeah, you're going to hear a perspective... Uh that you haven't heard before because I'm a lot more intelligent than most wrestlers. So I'll put it like this. If, if I'm in a fight out on the sidewalk, my goal is to end the fight as quickly as possible and thereby lessen the chances of any damage being done to me. Bam, if I can end it in uh, three seconds by knocking somebody out, sticking my thumb in their eye, something, uh, boom, then I'll do it. You're in a fight. You're protecting your life. In wrestling... I'm paid to go a certain amount of time. I might have to go 15 minutes. I might have to go 11 minutes. I might have to go 30 minutes. That's part of the job. The last thing I want to do is knock you out, although that has happened several times throughout my career where I've knocked people out during the match and was trying to try to not end the match, trying to keep it going. You know, some of that, thereby definitely theatrics. You have to be entertaining. You have to stand out. You have to connect to the people in such a way that you're worth money. And to be worth money in a business like that, that literally means you're selling tickets. If people don't pay to come and see you, well, then you're kind of a, just a spot filler on the card. Sometimes I'm friends with the guys, and uh, sometimes I legitimately don't like them. There's definitely a lot of uh, entertainment and theatrics to it. You know, I'm out there looking at the crowd soak and I am soaking up their energy just like it looks like I am I, I get off on their love but you know I point my thumbs to myself and you know I say I'm the whole f-ing show in real life I'm more I don't know if I would say that I'm an introvert but for the for the most part I get enough attention at my job to where I'm not trying to stand out with a bright red sports car I do have to ask this question. Apologies in advance, Rob. Say, for example, I fought against you. I know. (laughs) Silence is good. What would be a good sort of title for me? And how long do you think I'd I'd, uh, last in the ring? (laughs) Michael the Green Hornet Horn. Right? We'll start with that. I could make you or a broomstick look good for... A good eight minutes, you know, after like 10 minutes or so, you're going to want to end it. Because believe it or not, everything in the ring is hurtful. And when you start out wrestling, this is what would surprise most people. When you're first in the ring and you're learning to run the ropes, all underneath your armpit, your ribs are bruised after that first uh, workout. And it stays that way until you get conditioned to it. So forget about getting slammed on the mat. Someone that just wants to come in there and, and feel what it's like, they'd be very surprised. Any wrestler will back that up about the ropes bruising your sides because that's something that we all went through. So even taking it easy on you, dude, I don't think I can get more than 10 minutes out of you. <laughs> Why Michael? We could use Matt, but Matt is like a a part of the ring. I actually did some jobs uh, that people don't know about this, but like in 92 or so, I had just become Rob Van Dam shortly before that. Wasn't a superstar yet. And they used to have what they called enhancement matches where they would put like a local guy that's on his way up against the superstars. I did a match or two like that one time. I was living in Florida. Pat Tanaka hooked us up with this deal. It was 150 bucks for uh, for a match, and I was currently getting like 30 bucks a match, you know? So I was like, uh, yeah, dude, sign me up. And uh, so I tried to change my look. I was wearing a ponytail already, so I, I took that out. I wore blue trunks and stuff, but I called myself Matt Byrne. A lot of the guys that didn't get it, like including yourself so far, they put that on as the credits. But a lot of people, like wrestlers, would laugh at that because that's a that's a rib because obviously if you think about it uh you can imagine what a mat burn is right mm, mm. anyway just a, just a, a true little not known story anyway but i wrestled as mat burn as a joke uh 
a joke to those who got it. But, you know, if you really feel you want to stick with your real name, I'm not against that. Yeah, you might not want people to know that it's really uh, Matt Horn. That dude that just got his ass beat? No, that's some dude named Michael. <laughs> I mean, I look at your trivia on IMDb. I mean, there's so much. I mean, people can have a look because there's so much here that is wrestling-led. My question here is, obviously, you have stuff like mixed martial arts now that have obviously started to rise up. Where do you see the future of wrestling? That is a great question. I mean, you know, right now we're wondering how to even try to see the future of the world. You know, hopefully it won't be apocalyptic when we come out of the current state. We can't have live crowds now. So they've been doing some interesting stuff between all the different companies. There's got to be room for each one to be a little bit different. And in order for that, you know, the style has to be stretched, if that makes sense. So Mm. the rest of the style is definitely changing. I see WWE maybe doing more theatrical matches because I think they had some success with that recently. I didn't see it, but from what I understand, it was more like, like a movie. Because there's no live audience, you can take your time with it and and get really far away from wrestling. One of the companies, I guess they were on a football field, and they found all kinds of ways to use the goalpost to jump off of. And again, I didn't, I didn't see that. I just saw a, little, uh, a commercial for it or something. And I, I could see that continuing in that direction and getting away from wrestling a, as we know it. Standards are going to change, I believe, because they already have gone in such a direction over, especially over the 30 years that I've done it. You know, it used to be about protecting the business, and it was kind of like the mafia. You're kind of sworn in. In order to get in, you had to prove yourself and be invited in by a member. You know, kind of, and you didn't you didn't talk about anything about it. And now it's so opposite, and and it's changed so much that I, I think it's going to become more of a controlled fight situation where we can even control the environments that we fight in i don't know maybe like a a live video game any fan will want me to ask you this question (laughs) which is your favorite match well i gotta take a few different perspectives just to name one i would definitely say rvd versus john cena and that is not just because that was my crowning moment, that it was also how I did it, because that that's my, I don't know if plight is the right word, that's my path. I stuck to my guns, I preferred the hardcore style, and I fought to stay in that area because that's where I was showcased best, because I can uh, consume a lot of punishment, my body was very durable, and also, I liked being able to think outside of the box and be creative and not let rules hold me back in that in that way. So when I had the hardcore title, I loved it. That belt was meant to be a joke, but once I got it, I added respect to it. And pretty soon, I was main eventing shows, defending the hardcore title because the matches were so good. So then they retired the hardcore title because they never wanted it to mean that much. Uh, when we brought back... ECW on the WWE's uh, platform, that was me talking in Vince's ear. They got that ball rolling, and and I was helping push the ball the whole time. So by me sticking to what I believed in and uh, and all the like-minded fans, that's the only reason that I beat John Cena and was the WWE champion. If I hadn't changed the entire playing field by bringing that back, or even bringing it, you know, to that stage that it's never been to, that never would have happened. I, I, I'm sure of that. And so that was uh, my biggest achievement for many reasons. And then afterwards, on their on their TV, I'm able to showcase myself with uh, hardcore extreme matches, which was great um, until the downfall. Uh, but at first, ECW meant anything goes. People forget, but I had great matches. With Test, Bob Holly, Sabu, The Big Show, j- just to name a few, and then um, after they after they watered it down by having Raw and SmackDown wrestlers pollute it, well, that was pretty much pulling the plug on it, saying we know we're killing the spirit. There's nothing I could do about that. People forget about it. It was cool at first, and so that's my favorite match for all those reasons. Athletically showcasing me. I'm also very proud of my matches with Jerry Lynn and Sabu. 
Obviously, I'm not limiting this to current, but is there anyone you would like to fight? Whoever pays the most. That's always been my answer, and it's really not a cop-out. I don't watch wrestling and and think that way. I don't think, like, wow, I could have a really good match with him. You know, it's easier to work with my friends that I've, that I've worked with uh, a couple hundred times, you know what I mean? So, truthfully... That would be better because I'm at a stage now where easier is better. And that goes for everything. I've learned nothing beats comfort. And so it's hard to get me uh, up off the couch on a day off sometimes just because I'm comfortable. I'm in my zen. I'm home. I'm enjoying, you know, the the results of all of my years of hard work. I'm grateful. And um, a lot of times the last thing I want to do is, is leave home, whether it's on a flight or even just to go to a casino a few miles away and uh, do like a stand-up comedy thing. I thought when I first moved here I was going to be doing a lot more of that, but instead I signed this deal with Impact that allows me to take even more time off. So I, I guess I wouldn't say that I'm lazy, but I also think that's worth an argument. You've just mentioned something interesting I'm, I'm not sure if people are aware of, but you do stand-up comedy. Yeah, so sometimes I do stand up, and it's something I enjoy. I love writing it. I love, you know, doing it, delivering it, getting the audience's uh, instant reaction. It's not something that uh, that I want to look into doing full time or anything. But we we brought a camera along. I had a seven day tour, and we were going to film the tour just to make a, a movie out of the experience, the road trip with RVD. Um, I showed up with double vision because I, I got whacked in the head three nights before in a wrestling match. And I had never had concussion symptoms last that long. So I kept thinking, well, you know what, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and be fine. I'm not going to bother telling anybody. It didn't go away, though. So every night I was on stage uh, with the bright light in my eyes doing at least an hour, at least like about an hour every night. Um, for I guess six seven nights or whatever, and we filmed the whole thing, and uh, and then but we had to go past that. We had I had to go to I had to go to neurologists and I had to get you know the the CAT scans, the MRI. I had to get vision therapy, and I learned so much about concussions. This whole thing became a movie. Um, it was supposed to be just a little thing about comedy. It might have been a YouTube video. I don't know, but now it's a documentary on Amazon called headstrong and it's actually something not only did it turn out great but it's it's important for people to see it because i want us to learn what we can about concussion damage a lot of people don't want to talk about it it's that gray area but a lot of my friends uh, after having several concussions get depressed and then they kill themselves like that's a serious issue with wrestlers in my generation and i've had hundreds of concussions myself so I, I don't want to go out that way, and I certainly I can't imagine me doing it. But um, in the meantime, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do what I can to learn about the research, and that's also the uh, motivation for me starting RVD CBD for the same reason. From everything I'm reading about CBDs being able to help and CBGs actually regenerating dead brain tissue, if we can fight that, then we can fight depression and um, Alzheimer's and other areas that are that are very similar effect on the brain mm. well you mentioned documentaries you've got one coming out next year don't you um, what do I have coming out next year it's called still here yes thank you yeah so still here this uh, this kid has a uh, an amazing story he's a veteran and uh, while he was in the army he got his face blown up pretty much. He had to have a facial reconstruction and uh, a lot of his friends committing suicide. Uh, to hear the factors from him, I don't know enough to, uh, you know, I don't want to misquote the, the, uh, the numbers, but it's alarming how many people, and, and you know, all people from his squad, everybody uh, afterwards from post-traumatic stress, uh, they they kill themselves and he he told me he's gotten great results from CBD uh, we started talking because of this project that um, uh, actually tracks his path he decided 
you know, instead of throwing in the towel and killing himself, why not live out my dreams? And he was a huge wrestling fan. And so, you know, he got his face rebuilt and actually uh, is a professional wrestler now. And uh, he wrestles up in uh, Wisconsin and in the area. And uh, as part of this documentary, he's going to end up living his dream and wrestling his, uh, his hero, RVD. Oh, right. So you are actually going to have a have a proper match. Yeah, I mean, you know, this virus has, just like with everything else, has um, has put a, uh, a damper on plans. But uh, we're still planning on, uh, when, when we come out of this, a- as plans are of now, yes. It was already supposed to happen. I think February was the, the original date. But, yeah, that's, that's part of it. And, and you know, he, he's so inspiring. All of my projects like that are so, like, there's so much positive energy and love behind them. It's almost as good as his money when you're getting these reviews of people telling you how much you've helped their life, you know, whether it was through motivation or actually the product. You know, I have a superior pain cream that I stand behind and say definitely, you know, try this. It's amazing the, the letters that I'm getting from people saying they've tried all the other stuff. And it makes sense because I, I got 3,000 milligrams uh, in a four-ounce bottle of CBD compared to some that have like 750. I've been learning. I'm going to continue to learn a lot, everything I can about CBD, about the whole marijuana plant, which I love. I love the plant. That's my passion that I have for many, many years. And I'm also you know, going to learn everything I can about, about this whole concussion thing as well. Like that's, that's the path that I'm on right now is learning everything I can and using that knowledge to help advance knowledge in just helping people with overall health. I looked on your trivia and I found out that two of your favorite films are Kill Bill volume one and two. Wow. I must've done that. So, uh, so long ago to tell you the truth. <laughs> um, I have a hard time picking up favorites of anything. I don't know, just the way that my brain works, I think that's one of the many areas that I'm different than most people. For instance, I'm not very musical. Like, I don't even listen to music very much on my own at all, whereas I know most people love music. And um, I don't know anything about sports cars. I don't don't even watch sports. I watch some wrestling, mostly to help uh, Katie, Katie, you know, learn stuff because she's at that stage. My girlfriend, Katie Forbes, slash spiritual life and and so that's also an area whenever i get asked you know my favorite match i can see that one you know as my crowning moment and if you ask me what my favorite movie is i'm probably going to go with whatever pops up in my head i did love those movies i love all of uh, quentin tarantino movies that i that i've seen pretty much so i think i could have just as easily said pulp fiction or get shorty which was inspired by tarantino i don't know if he wrote the script or what but get shorty Stands out, definitely, but I might give you another answer tomorrow. No sort of films that have done wrestling. Do you watch them and think, God, this is not what it is? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's the movie The Wrestler. We were all so excited that an A movie was coming out that was going to pop our industry and draw a lot of attention to it. And the movie was so depressing, but it was very realistic. Uh but I was sad that they chose just that story to tell because that is a lot of my friends. They are Ram Ramsey. There they are with their fanny pack on, uh, living in a trailer park. All that, all that is super, super authentic. But that's not all of us. You know what I mean? I'm definitely not in that position. It would have been cool to see like a happier story with a superstar wrestler that you know that's successful. And one doesn't necessarily come to mind. If there has been one, then then I apologize for not being able to think of it, but I, I feel like there could be a void there. But, you know, a lot of stuff is real because it's documentaries. Big fan of documentaries. I just, I love real life. I love nonfiction. So, obviously, you do have an acting career. Are there any roles that you haven't done yet that you would like to do? <laughs> uh, well, actually, yeah, I have a project that has been on the table for a long time. I think it might even come up under my IMDb. I wrote this story, made it into a comic book, and then I just self-published a a few hundred copies. Uh, So not very many people have seen it, although I might have some on my eBay. But anyway, I wrote this, uh, this story, and then I became friends with this movie maker, 
Chris Ray is a good friend of mine, and I met him doing uh, Shark Attack 3, <laughs> which is the funnest movie I, that uh, I think I'd, I'd been part of. And then, you know, we did the Sniper movie with Steven Seagal, and uh, through Chris, my comic book story has been on the table probably since 2016, uh, and there's been several reasons why it hasn't been like the number one priority for, for either of us. And I don't know for sure if that ever will happen, but I definitely know that I could portray the protagonist from that. That would actually be awesome because you know, I, I don't consider myself a great actor. Uh, I, I never did. I'm not like someone that just needs to be discovered, you know, be seen by the right person and boom, I'll take off. It's, it's not as natural. I've learned a lot over the years, so I'm a lot, a lot more comfortable with stuff now than, than I was on even my my starring role, which was Wrong Side of Town. Since then, I've got a lot of experience. And there's a couple, two or three I've done that haven't uh, even even been released yet. Uh, but anyway, maybe someday uh, when I'm not so busy, maybe I'll get behind it. My age difference already <laughs> since since we started this project has, has changed so much that it might have to be someone else playing the main character, or I might have to change uh, him and put him down the road a few years. Hmm. What's it called? Twisted Perception is the uh, is like the umbrella. It's actually like I wrote like a three or four book series that I never published, and then the one that I did self publish is actually a story several years later of the same character that was like it's a trade paperback with four books in it that that run is called soldiers of karma and that's what the movie is uh copy written as uh so soldiers of karma and twisted perception if you look it up and can't find it under that but uh we've even talked recently about doing an animation with it there's some money behind it if we get some more money enough to reach the budget to do it but honestly it's something that i hardly ever think about and just like all my projects or everything in life it usually seems to organically make its way around to being in the front position uh right at the perfect time well i'm gonna give you a one minute plug i'm obviously gonna tell him that saints row the third remastered is out now and yeah actually rob when's your next fight who are you fighting next it looks like July 18th, Slammiversary. My opponent hasn't been announced yet. And even even that week of uh, filming, because we'll probably do some TV around that, hasn't been announced yet. We just finished some tapings last week. We're not really traveling. We're doing our, all our filming right now in front of no crowd in, in Nashville, Tennessee. So it's nothing, nothing to plug except, you know, the ones that I've already done are in the can and always were on Access TV on Tuesday nights. Mm. Well, Rob, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. Cool, and, and you as well. And uh, check out our rvdcbd.com. That's something else that the virus uh, kept me from a, a big convention in London I was going to be at in March. Yeah, we would have already had distribution set up. You would have been able to go down the street and, uh, and buy some RVD. RVD CBD cream tonight, but that got put off. Big London CBD Expo, but it's still going to happen. Everything's still going to happen, so everybody hang in there, and plans got delayed for all of us. It's time to be grateful if you can, and uh, definitely stay safe. Mm. Right? Mm. Thanks very much for your time, Rob. All right, man. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, man.